and where it seems like many, many people are moving. We have a lot of New Yorkers moving here, a lot of people from the Bay Area moving here. And uh, it's interesting. Okay. So it's actually episode 51. And tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about, well, a lot about cannabis. And the reason that I wanted to talk about it is because it seems like whenever you turn on the TV, that there's all kinds of people talking about it, but in a pop culture sense, like if you watch shows on Netflix or shows on TV, it seems like there is this almost irrational um, embrace of this. And I wanted to look at why is it that pop culture, Hollywood and entertainment is sort of promoting this and what's the reality of cannabis? Because it has, of course, a lot of beneficial uh, medical uses, which we'll talk about. But the question is really, is for recreational use, is it as safe as sort of all of the TV shows on Netflix show or HBO or whatever the, whatever the case may be? So that's what we'll be talking about tonight. See, we have some more people coming in, welcome. And let me <clears throat> share my screen. Uh, let's see here. It's like I'm having, okay, here we go. Let me close some of these things down. And then we will get started. All right, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. I'm gonna blow this up a little bit. And then we will get started. Welcome everyone, people still filtering in. Okay, so tonight we are, as I said, going to be talking about cannabis. <clears throat> and we're gonna start out by speaking about what's called the endocannabinoid system. And actually I gave a, a talk, one of my episodes, probably, I don't know, 10, 12 weeks ago about how you can activate this particular system without cannabis. Um, then we'll move on to talking about hemp, the difference between hemp and cannabis. And then we'll talk about cannabis-based medicines and cannabis dependence. Then we'll move on to public perception, which we touched on already, trends in potency, and then an alternate view from, from Chinese medicine, which I think is really good because it gives us a little bit of a better understanding of why some people, I think it gives a better understanding of, of why some people use it recreationally. Um, they think, some people are, think they're using it recre recreationally, um, but in fact, oftentimes they're actually medicating themselves. So we'll get into that as well. And there's certainly a lot to talk about. Um, and then we'll have, I got so much positive feedback last week because we, I did, for the people who weren't with me last week, uh, we have a test at the very end. And you wouldn't believe the amount of positive feedback that I got on, on having a test at the end. So there will be a test at the end. So pay attention and I'll give you hints along the way that, uh, that you will be tested on certain, certain things. All right, so let's get started and we'll talk about the endocannabinoid system. And <clears throat> basically you have to understand that the way the, the body works is that a, lo a lot of things in the body are based on receptors. Uh, in other words, it's, it's almost like a lock and a key. And certain chemicals go through the blood and on the outside of many cells, there are receptors and something comes in and it's, a, it's like a, a key that hits a lock that then activates, <clears throat> that activates sometimes, you know, an opening into the cell or a whole, whole host of signaling molecules. That's not important. The important thing is that is to understand that in the body, there are receptors and then there are keys. And these locks, receptors are often activated by not just one kind of key. Keys that look kind of like one key it are also can activate it. And this will be important in just a moment. So essentially there are two basic receptors in the body. There is what's called the, the CB1 receptor um, and this is, <clears throat> there's a chemical called anandamide from, I think in Hindu teaching, 
Ananda means bliss, uh, naturally occurring in the body. And what I wanna point out first and foremost, actually, is that a lot of people have the mistaken notion that <clears throat> the endocannabinoid system is, has some, some sort of unique connection with cannabis because it, it was named after it. Well, the, the reason it's called the endocannabinoid system is because the, the doctors or the researchers, um, all the work was actually done in Israel that identified these, but the, the Israeli uh, professors that, that discovered these receptors discovered it because they discovered the receptor that THC, the active component of, of marijuana, binds to. In, in this case, um, it's related to the CB1 receptor, <clears throat> which basically means that if it was another compound that activates the CB1 receptor, it would have been called something else. Or if he sort of isolated anandamide, he could have called it the you know, maybe the anandamide system or whatever the case may be. But the point is, is that a lot of people have this mistaken notion that somehow because marijuana activates these naturally occurring receptors, that somehow that we are linked in some unique way with the cannabis plant. And that's not the case. It just is sort of a, not a mistake of naming, but just it reflects the origin of the research that it was based on how cannabis is sort of work, working in the body. Now, um, anandamide is naturally occurring. So why, why do we have this endocannabinoid system? Well, I said we have uh, two receptors. So the first receptor, um, your body actually natu naturally releases this anandamide um, and it plays lots of different roles, it plays a role in feeding, uh, in feeding behavior, memory, motivation, pleasure, uh, affects pain sensation. We'll talk about, about pain in a, in a little bit. Um, and it's present for a very short period of time. Now, CB2, which some people associate uh, with, so most people associate CB1 with THC, which is, again, the psychoactive component of marijuana. Most of you have heard of people referring to THC. If you haven't, if you haven't THC is the, the part of marijuana that makes you get high. Um, then there's CB2 and CB2 does other things. It, it reduces inflammation and it sh can shut down inf inflammation. It can affect mood. Um, it's affected, affects the, um, over the immune cells, which therefore can, can uh, be important for autoimmune disease. So we can see that the, the um, endocannabinoid system has a great deal of importance to the body. Uh, it's doing all these things that, that we've been talking about. So it seems that it's important for us to pay attention to what this is. And I agree, it is very important because we're going to learn more and more about this system as science progresses. The problem I have is that it's not just related, as I've said, to cannabis. There's a whole host of other things that can interact with this. Now, compounds, that affect these receptors. Remember, I was saying that when you have a receptor, the key to the receptor doesn't have to be exact. You can have other compounds that interact with the lock. Um, and therefore, there are various different kinds of compounds. There are the endogenous ones, the ones that are produced by the body. We spoke about one called anandamide, um, but also there are what are called phytocannabinoids. Now these are, phyto means plant. So these are plant-based cannabinoids. Now, many of you, everyone has heard about CBD. And a lot of people mistakenly think that, CB, that CBD is mainly working on the CB2 receptor. That's not actually the case. Um, it, it does have weak binding to, to, both, to both CB1 and CB2, but ultimately it's working through a whole host of other mechanisms. One is through what's called NF-kappa B, but really all you have to know is it's sort of the inflammatory on and off switch. One of the inflammatory on and off switches. And there are lots of things that can, <coughs> that can also inhibit the, um, the NF-kappa B, polyphenols, terpenes, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, other dietary cannabinoids, 
Essential oils are, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but essential oils, I'll just put them up on the screen so you can see. Uh, rosemary is, can, can, I, can, can actually activate it. Um, milk thistle, garlic and, garlic and onions. Uh, essential oils, so things like um, eucalyptus, uh, lavender, these essential oils that you could say put in, the, in your bath that make you feel relaxed. Well, one of the reasons they make you feel relaxed is because they're acting as dietary, or not dietary, but acting as phytocannabinoids, meaning that they, when you interact with them, it's, like a, it's not an exact match to the receptor, but it is you know, partial and therefore you're going to get some sort of activation. Uh, if you want to know more details about phytocannabinoids, then you can go onto my YouTube channel. We spoke quite a bit about that in one of the, the other episodes. Um, and it works through a whole host of other things that we're actually not going to get into just because there's probably going to be, there's definitely a lot of material I want to, want to get through. <clears throat> okay, so let's jump into can hemp and cannabis. So basically, uh, we all know that that, uh, well, I'm not going to assume we know, but anyone knows anything, but um, basically they're from the same family, hemp and cannabis, except the subspecies is a little bit different. Uh, so unfortunately, because of what, I, you know, because of laws for, for cannabis, um, you know, hemp is a very, very valuable crop. Obviously, you can, many of you know it for, for use in fiber. Uh, it can make cloth, it can make paper. It's an incredibly usable, usable um, plant for a whole host of reasons, including food. Uh, I, I eat hemp seeds all the time. Uh, the oil is a very good source of both omega, pure omega-6 and omega-3. Uh, it's, I use it for a lot of patients with atopic dermatitis to take by take by mouth. It's a very important uh, supplement in that regard. And uh, it's unfortunately not used as much as it, as it could be because laws, uh, unreasonable laws sort of branded these two things to be identical. And it was very difficult. Uh, one of the reasons why Canada is so far ahead in terms of both hemp and cannabis is because they didn't, they, they didn't have they were able to they were able to grow hemp and you know even as the cannabis laws were relaxing in Canada even before that they were able to grow to grow hemp all right now let's talk a little bit about marijuana so of course you know it can be used as a medicine um, it's you know we we know of all these words pot dope grass weed mary jane bud hash bong kef ganja you know we we know we've heard of all these in hollywood movies etc the difference, of course, we spoke about hemp being mostly the stems. Well, in cannabis, it's mostly the leaves, flowers, sometimes, sometimes the stems, sometimes the seeds. And I, I wanted, I put this in here because I wanted people to just see what's sort of happening in the cannabis industry um, now that it's growing so much. And what you can see here, one of the reasons why I wanted to include this is because remember I was talking about this concept of phytocannabinoids and, and there are other chemicals that are in the plant that can affect the, the receptors and affect sort of the potency. And these are often, you know, we, we spoke about uh, some of these already. Uh, you know, we spoke about terpene. These are all kind of terpenes. Um, and these are various cannabis family uh, with brand names and, and everything and banana blaze and uh, think fast, auto, Cinderella, Jack. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that e some of these have not just um, not just the THC, you know, they also have CBD and they have all these other chemicals that uh, create what's called an entourage effect where, where you get uh, a different potency based on other chemicals that are, that are in the plant. Just something I thought you would find interesting. Okay, so let's move on to medicine versus and discuss uh, cannabis dependence. So it's one of the oldest medicines. In China, it was used as an anesthetic. In India, um, it was 
I'm not sure what it was used in India, but it was also used ceremonially in India. The sadhus would 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 probably still still smoke it to help with, um, I believe, meditation or or something of that sort. And it's obviously been known forever, forever and ever, long, long time. But let's look at the medications. And we've now spoken a little bit about how THC is the psychoactive component. Many of you know that. And then there's, of course, CBD, which is in everything now. And um, I had a, a massage a, a week or two ago, and they used a, a CBD um, like uh, oil on me. Uh, I don't know if I, I felt anything different, but uh, it's, it's in everything you know, these days. So what we can think about medications basically in three different general categories. There's THC-based medicines and those we uh, know like appetite, help with appetite loss, anti-emetic, so preventing um, vomiting, uh, improving nausea. Then there are combined THC and CBD medicines like one that's used for, for muscle spasticity and multiple sclerosis. And then there are CBD-based ones that are, are a few rare childhood epilepsies. And I think there was like a, wasn't there a documentary or a movie about how before you could get CBD, the people who, who were trying to get CBD couldn't get it. Uh, obviously, that makes no sense because you'll see soon that there is virtually no risk for, for CBD. Um, for pain, there have been lots of studies for pain. And in this, in this one, sound that, uh, that medical cannabis can indeed diminish prescription opioid usage, working as a preferred alternative to prescription opioids in over half of patients. So, wow, we all know about the terrible opioid epidemic that we have. Maybe uh, these medicines are going to really help us with that. Um, this, this paper by uh, Pipper et al. identified a reduction in opioid overdose in those states that legalized marijuana. So that looks very, very good as well. Additionally, for pain, there were lower levels of alcohol use and non-cannabis drug use compared to recreational users. Uh, with recreational users, there was often uh, a, some association with alcohol and other, and other drugs. But in the case for people who are using it for, for pain, there was actually lower use of alcohol, lower use of other drugs. So when it comes to pain and it comes to MS and you know, cancer patients who need to increase their appetite and people who are having trouble with, with nausea or vomiting, uh, some epilepsies, all of these seems like they are, it's, a, it's an amazing medication to have available. Well, what about help for anxiety and depression? Because quite frankly, a lot of people are self-medicating with, with marijuana. I mean, all, you know, I, I'm of an age where I, I have quite a number of friends who use marijuana. It's just something that they do. And um, unfortunately, we're seeing this at younger and younger ages that we're talking about. Um, and, you know, it's concerning to me because I've done, I just, you know, I'm no expert in marijuana. Um, one could One could say, you know, what gives me the expertise to even speak on, on the subject, but it is something that I've followed and I have done a, a, you know, a fair amount of reading. Um, but from a sociological perspective, my view is, you know, we all have our own views of one, the people that we know who, who um, smoke marijuana. And then, we, uh, and then we have the scientific literature. And of course, all of us will come up with our own um, Conclusions. Anyway, how about help for anxiety and depression? Well, believe it or not, and antidepressant and anti-anxiety medicines decrease in states with medical marijuana laws. How do you like that? But there is absolutely no evidence that it is helpful. And in fact, we'll talk a little bit later about how, unfortunately, there is sometimes dependence and such that when people get off, they, they can have an increase in, in anxiety. So even though the medications have been reduced. We don't really have a whole lot of data that proves that in the long run, it's actually something that's helpful for anxiety and depression. So let's now talk a little bit about addiction and dependence. 
And um, I'm gonna close a bunch of these things here. Giving out some of the, oh, uh, wanted to save that, but okay. So, <laughs> all right, so addiction generally is, is defined, right? As a relapsing disorder that is characterized by a powerful motivation to continually engage. A dependence can occur without drug seeking activity or persistent negative consequences. Um, we'll talk about these sorts of things because addiction is less of a concern. Uh, dependence is more of a concern. So what are the risks of dependence? 8.9% is the risk of dependence. In other words, 8.9% 8 of people who use marijuana become dependent on it, meaning that they don't, they really continue, continue to use and feel like the, for them to, to, to perform or to relieve some and some sort of discomfort or even to the point where they just feel more together or feel more connected or feel more creative, they get gets to a point where they want to, they almost need to continue to use it. Now there is a sort of a thing that you have to realize that, you know, if, if you're taking a medicine, say for pain, and when you take the medicine, the, the pain goes away, and then it, the pain goes away, comes back, then you, you take the medicine again. That's actually a form of dependence. So you have to think about the, the, the way the word dependence is used, but what about other kinds of drugs? So what's the risk of, de of dependence on cocaine? 20%, tobacco is 67%, and alcohol is 22%. I thought those numbers were, were really interesting. I would have thought this was actually much, much higher. Uh, maybe the addiction rate, uh, anyway, I, I would have thought this was higher, but apparently it is not. So 8.9%, yeah, is that a small number or is that a big number? Well, in comparison to the others, it's smaller. Uh, the, the point um, I think that it is that as more people think that this is some sort of health, like a health food, I mean, honestly, if you watch TV shows, I mean, I, a couple of weeks ago, I turned on Netflix and there was this show where they actually were cooking with cannabis. It was like a culinary, they had cannabis, culinary cannabis chefs. Now I, I am a libertarian when it comes to, I don't mind if people smoke or they don't smoke at all. It doesn't, but I don't, it, you know, I don't really care. Um, I just find it interesting that we are getting to a place in popular culture where it's as if it's nothing. And you know, they were talking about the THC levels in, in each dish and um, as if you know, people have become so experienced that, you know, oh, I know my dosage and, and these sorts of things. I mean, people are talking about, oh, you know, I'm gonna eat this thing and it's gonna have su such and such dose and therefore I know this and that. To me, that sounds like you're using a medication and um, whether that's good or bad, again, you can choose, you can make your own conclusions about that. I'm just giving you some of the facts that concern me. And um, some people will see 8.9% and say, oh my gosh, that's incredibly low, not a concern. That's, that's for you to make that decision, not, not me. And as I said, the problem really comes down to increasing penetration into popular culture. And so why is this number combined with this important because as more and more people think that it's some kind of health uh, food or <laughs> health supplement, the more of the more we're going to see problems at, even at a low level of 8.9% of people becoming dependent. And in Europe, cannabis now accounts for more, more first time entrance to drug treatment centers than any other illicit drug. And um, that is Again, not a, function, not a function of a high risk of dependence, but because so many people um, and the popular conception and culture is such that it's not that dangerous, that that is what accounts for these sorts of things. Uh, now, when it comes to comparing the, the THC content of marijuana over the last 40 years, and the way they, they study this is they look at confiscated marijuana from 40, you know, that has been confiscated over the years, the level of THC content has actually doubled. And you'll see as we go through this class that as the, as, as the THC level increases, the risk for all kinds of problems increases. 
uh, oh, I write it, wrote it here, the risk of, uh, in this particular article said, the risk of recreational cannabis dependence is more common with high potency THC strains with a low CBD content, uh, large amounts consumed, high frequency use, heavier daily, and starting early use in adolescence. And I, I like to make note that um, these, they have shown some, some brain changes in people who are young when they are, especially in adolescence. But what you should know is that the brain does not finish developing until the age of 25. Um, and a lot of people, quite frankly, most, most people who are of that generation are starting way before the age of 25. And while the studies, to be, to be honest, show more damage in adolescence, I think it's important to recognize that the brain doesn't stop developing until the age of 25. So I highly recommend that, you know, if, if you're going to decide that this is something that, you know, whether culturally or the group that you're in or, or, you know, whatever the case may be, you, that you shouldn't start. I mean, I don't think you should start anyway, but I mean, if you decided that you wanted to start, um, then certainly after the age of 25, Another thing is, uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the work of, um, I'm blanking on his name. He's, uh, he's written a, a lot of books on brain imaging. Um, and, you know, there's a very specific pattern of, there's something called a PET scan. And the PET scan really looks at, at sort of the way the brain is, is taking up certain things and lights up in certain ways. People who are doing a lot of THC have a very disordered um, very disordered brain pattern on, on PET scans as well. <clears throat> so just something to, something to be aware of. In fact, the pattern is so specific that in, in his clinics, um, you, he can identify by the scan people who use marijuana on a regular basis. So most people think, you know, withdrawal is not really an issue, but actually there's something called cannabis withdrawal and this affects 50% of daily users. Now, these are heavy users. These are people who are using marijuana daily, but the, but you know, and that's a very high number. I mean, think about that. I don't know how long they have to, to be doing it daily, but I've, I've certainly known people in my life who are daily users and what happens, it, it basically starts a couple days afterwards and then peaks around, uh, around a week later and they get weird, they get cravings for, for marijuana, sleep problems, nightmares, anger, irritability, and nausea. And there's reduction in the CB1 receptors during this. Um, I should mention, you know, I, me I mentioned it here briefly, but it, it just so happens that a lot of the marijuana suppliers or growers are aware of the fact that having a high THC with low CBD and low, all those other terpenes is going to probably mitigate you know, lessen the risk of some of these, these problems. Um, and so they are, as I showed you in that table growing with, you know, looking at trying to get the, the CBD uh, levels up. Now, when you talk to people who are, you know, connoisseurs of, of marijuana, you know, they, they often know the different, differing mental uh, effects of various, you know, ratios of THC to CBD to, CBN, there's a, a CBN as well, and a whole host of, of terp, terpenes and terpenoids, et cetera. Um, but uh, it does appear that a, a, a higher CBD count uh, with, with THC does seem to make it a little bit less risky. Uh, how, how less, I, I wouldn't count on it being significantly less, but there is cannabis uh, withdrawal syndrome. And if it affects 50% of daily users, that doesn't mean it doesn't affect people who are using it on say a weekly basis, it just means it would be a much less, uh, less percentage. Uh, what about CBD? Well, CBD has absolutely no abuse potential whatsoever. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, the, C the CBD, CBD doesn't even really, uh, it only weakly activates CB1 and CB2. It's working through a whole host of other mechanisms. So nothing wrong with CBD. You do have to be aware that some CBD, it's hard to make CBD without having a little THC in it. 
So it is possible if you're, you know, if you're getting a CBD supplement that there's going to be a very, very small amount of, of THC. Um, just something to, to keep in mind if you're going to try that. And what about how people use? Well, how do people use it? I mean, maybe people just want to chill. Maybe they just want to relax. And, you know, maybe there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think there is. But, and we'll talk about how to do that without relying on a medication. Um, but maybe people just want to chill. But um, this, this article found strong evidence pointing to an increased risk of, of cannabis use disorder among individuals who use cannabis in order to cope with mental stress. Now, obviously, there's a difference between people who just are at a party, I guess you could say, and I don't know, they're trying to be part of the party or whatever the, the case may be. Um, but if I look at my friends who, who use it, they, they use it because they're, in a sense, I mean, I, I haven't spoken to them in detail because they know my negative views and, and therefore don't talk to me about it too much. But when I look at their lives, oftentimes I think it's because they need to balance out a certain, certain type of, of energy, certain amount of mental distress. And if, if that's the case, then there is an increased risk for, um, for cannabis use disorder among those individuals. And how many of people who, you know, who are using it are in that case? What about creativity? I mean, all the jazz artists were involved, doing all kinds of, of drugs and they, you know, they were pretty, pretty creative. Well, at low doses, there was no effect on creativity. At higher doses, it lowered creativity. Whoops. Uh, that's not a question mark. They've actually studied that. It actually um, lowers your creativity. And quite frankly, if you're creative, you know, you're creative, if you're super creative and then you are maybe more relaxed <laughs> with being on marijuana, uh, you may feel as though you're more creative, but in fact, you are absolutely less, uh, less creative. So that, that, has, that has been studied. And there's probably some placebo effect. I mean, there you are, you have an altered mental state. And, you know, there's a Dr. Andrew Weil, who is sort of one of the pioneers of, of natural health and healing, you know, often says that humans have, a innate, have an innate desire to alter their consciousness whether that's through alcohol or, what it, or whatever the case may be. But we do have this inherent desire to, to change our consciousness. Uh, of course, there are drug ways and other ways of doing that. But quite frankly, um, it has been studied and you are absolutely not more creative when you are high. All right, so let's move on to some other problems. Um, driving while stoned. It's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Ask any police officer. Um, I have patients who are police officers and they often tell me of, of problems nowadays with people who are obviously under the influence of, of marijuana while, while driving. There is um, psychosis. Of course, there's sometimes temporary psychosis or paranoia. Uh, I, I know someone who was, was given a, some sort of marijuana edible and I guess he was supposed to have like one quarter of the edible, but thought it was, so he ate, ate the whole thing and he was in his bed for a, over a day, just completely paranoid, couldn't walk out of, out of the house. Of course, these are extreme examples, but sometimes the examples are also prove a point. Now, when it comes to actual psychosis, there actually has been some interesting studies there is an increased risk and it was determined that it flowed from cannabis to psychosis and not from psychosis to cannabis. They're able to look at that. Uh, so there is an increased risk. There's also multiple studies that show that um, the cannabis use disorder is a significant predictor of psychosis. Again, higher risk with higher THC. Um, that's going to be a repeated, repeated thing. And cannabis use has been characterized as one of the strongest modifiable risk factors for developing a psychotic disorder with a recommendation that a teen or ch child or teen with a family history of psychosis or, pro or prodromal symptoms should be informed of the risks and counseled strongly not to use cannabis. I do, uh, with patients, we do um, genetic analyses and, and there are genes that, 
that um, can be looked at to, you know, to see whether there are some issues. Sometimes edibles have a different risk because they, they're processed in the bodies somewhat differently than when people are smoking. And there are people that, that have issues with that and can have an increased risk for paranoia during, during these sorts of things. I think the point that I'm trying to make here is we're dealing with something that has significant effects in the body and to and popular culture's relegation to giggles and looking at it as a health food is, is a problem. And you might be thinking, oh man, th this guy just needs to relax. <laughs> well, I, I really think it's obvious that there are issues that, that are, you know, um, significant. Of course, toxic smoke, the smoke from smoking weed is, is very, very toxic. And of course, everyone says, well, I'm not smoking it all that much, but it is significantly toxic. Okay, so we've covered a whole host of things and I hope you're learning a lot. Um, additionally, I would just say that, you know, because of the genetic issue, you know, if people don't have, if they're adopted, let's say, and they, they aren't aware of their genetics, again, it might be an issue that they, you know, you just don't know if there is some family history of, of schizophrenia or something that unfortunately could put you in a risk, higher risk of, of problems with, with marijuana. What about the public perception? It sort of makes sense. I mean, I think we've, we've already covered it, but there's an inverse relationship between the perceived harmfulness of cannabis and the likelihood of use. So it has been shown, of course, that the, the higher, uh, the lower the perceived harmlessness of cannabis, the higher the use. Uh, increasing pub public perception that cannabis is harmless is, is rising. In 2016, only about 30% of uh, 12th graders perceived a risk of daily use. Uh, how, how do you like that? 12th graders, right? They're 17, 18 years old, and only 30% think there's a risk of daily use. Uh, so when it comes to younger people, they have been influenced by popular culture in such a way that, of course, we all are, and they've been conditioned, they've, look, we are products of our culture. And a lot of the opinions that we hold, of course, are going to be influenced by the culture around us. And sometimes those things are, are good, respect for hopeful, hopefully respect for elders, uh, things like that, um, respecting police officers, you know, the, some of these things are, are you know, no longer, are no longer that, that well respected. But point is it's culture obviously is a is a, a plus and a minus. In this case, for young people, it is clear that popular culture's embrace of marijuana is leading to a view of marijuana that is completely not consistent with the reality of it as a drug, which it, which it is. And it's no longer the drug of 40, of 40 years ago because we know it's double as strong as it was. And even adults, the perception that cannabis use involves great risk declined from 50% uh, between 2002 to 2014 where adults said 33%, there was only a 33% risk. While the perception that use involves no risk increased from six to 15%. So what we see here is that adults who are more a product of of last generation's um, cultural attitudes and the younger groups of 17 to, you know, to 20, say 25, 30, I would probably say, have a completely different view, both of which are not consistent with reality and a result of, of cultural conditioning. And this is just incredibly, well, it's understandable. Again, just turn on Netflix, turn on music videos, whatever the case may be, and you'll see that it is praised and glorified. Um, and again, I am complete libertarian in this regard. I don't think it should be criminal. I, I think it should be decriminalized if not made, made legal. Um, I, even with my uh, opinions on that, because uh, that's just how I feel. First of all, no one should be, uh, I'm more in favor of, of decriminalization in this, in the sense that I don't think anyone should be put in jail for, for marijuana. 
And I don't, I'm looking at it more from a medical perspective, but I still think people need to be able to make decisions for themselves. Okay, moving right along, get off my soapbox there. We've spoken about it before. Um, in 40 years, the average dose has doubled. Amazing. And we know, and this is the average THC dose. THC. Okay, so we've covered everything I wanted to cover, but I wanted to, to finish with our, with our test and with an alternative view from traditional Chinese medicine. And bear with me, because it sounds like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense or that it's not scientific, but I think you're going to understand this a little bit better. You know, there is obviously a duality in everything. There's light, dark, male, female, active, and rest this sort of thing. Yang, and her, yang is basically active, masculine, sort of stereotypical masculine energy. And yin is sort of calm, um, uh, you know, dark versus light, more stereotypical uh, feminine attributes. And cannabis would be considered very, very yin. So what I'm suggesting here, not me, but uh, this was a, com a conversation I had with with a friend of mine who's a traditional Chinese medicine doctor, is that a lot of the people that I know use it because they're balancing out their energy. Meaning if they're hard charging type A personality types, they are, those people often are uh, in Chinese medicine would be called young, young um, predominant, I guess you could say. They have more yang than, than yin and ultimately life right, is about balance. It's like, you know, the yin and yang uh, symbol. So what's, what's happening, in s at least some of the friends that I have, they are so overpowered, they're so uh, driving, they are on the nonstop go. They are, they like marijuana because it brings more yin into their life. It brings more of a balance into their life. Of course, they're using a medication for it, uh, which, which, what, which is what mar marijuana is but they might not necessarily even be conscious of the fact that they need a little bit more yin in, in their life or balancing out this active versus, versus relaxing. But you can activate yin in lots of different ways. Baths, you know, you think about men, men don't often, often take baths. Um, women take more baths because they're naturally more, more yin. Uh, meditation, prayer, reducing clutter, there are various foods like fruits and vegetables. There are various kinds of exercises like Qigong. There's certain yin styles that can influence this. But, I, but the reason I bring it up is just to illustrate the point that sometimes people are using this as a kind of medication and they're not really aware of, of the situation. And this is again, just personal observation in combination with personal observation of people that I know um, and how they're using it, and conversations with, uh, with my friend who's a traditional Chinese medicine doctor. And I just thought it was an interesting way of thinking about, about one of the ways people use, people use marijuana. Okay. And I might add that I, I don't harbor any sort of uh, judgment about you using marijuana at all. Like, again, I'm a complete libertarian when it comes to that. If you want to use marijuana, that's fine. I don't have, I don't look at you negatively. I don't um, have any negative opinions whatsoever. Uh, I do take exception to unscientific portrayals in popular culture, uh, for sure, because of the teaching that it does to, to people who are young who might not have access to some of the scientific information. All right, so let's uh, go to our test now. <laughs> uh, give me a moment, let me sh stop sharing the screen and then go to the other screen and then we will finish tonight's class. Okay, one moment. Okay, so I think should see me double on the screen here and I go over here. All right. And uh, someone told me last time I needed to blow the screen way up. Okay. 
All right, so everyone should be able to see my screen and we're coming up near the end. There are 14 questions and we're going to, let me bring up the chat box so I can see your, your, um, your comments. Uh, Helen's already answering, okay. <laughs> How many main receptors are there in the endocannabinoid system? One, two, three, or four? And just type it into the chat box. All right, very good. There are two, remember CB1, which is the one that THC is mostly associated and CB2, which doesn't have any psychoactive uh, component. All right, moving on to the next question. Which receptor is mainly associated with THC, CB1, CB2, or CBGB? <laughs> Anyone? Right, correct. We are looking at CB1, excellent. Okay, next question is loading. Okay, why is the endocannabinoid system called the endocannabinoid system? A, because we have a weird connection with the cannabis plant, Two, because the initial studies show that it is where THC binds, because it is only activated by cannabis, because it was found by Dr. Joseph Cannabis. Correct. B is the answer. Good job, everyone. You guys finish typing before I even finish reading the, the question. The true or false, the endocannabinoid system can be activated by other plants besides cannabis. All right, very good, excellent. A, true. And my favorite is using essential oils like lavender. Cannabis and hemp are the exact same plant family and plant subspecies, true or, or false, so false. False, that's correct. They are very, very similar, but the subspecies is different. And we spoke about how hemp is mostly the, the uh, stem uh, and of course the seeds for oil and for food uh, and marijuana, they often use the buds and the leaves, sometimes, uh, sometimes the stems as well. Hemp has been used for fiber, food, oil, all of the above, A, B, C, or D. Yep, that's right, all of the above. And as I said, hemp oil uh, for people of atopic dermatitis, it's one of the uses I, um, I give commonly because of the, the essential fatty acids, very good source of essential fatty acids. Which of the following conditions has marijuana not been shown to help? Appetite loss, certain types of epilepsy, mu muscle spasticity, anxiety and depression, and pain. Which one is it? Okay, yeah, that is correct. It is anxiety and depression. While people often self-medicate for anxiety and depression, most of the studies that have looked into this do not show that it has, uh, has a beneficial effect for that, uh, looking, at, looking at it long-term. What is the risk of dependence of marijuana? 20%, 8.9%, 67%, 5%. Yeah, that's right. 8.9% risk for marijuana dependence. And what I, what I focused on on that is that because of the decreased, um, the perception of decreased risk, we're getting a whole lot more people coming into clinics because of, of this number, even though it's low. 20% was, was cocaine. And uh, I think the tobacco was 67%. How has THC content increased in the last 40 years? Two times, three times, or decreased in dose? Yeah, you guys are good. You remember two, two times, fully, fully double that. So your, your grandmother's marijuana was really not that potent. And now it is very, very potent. <clears throat> the rate of cannabis withdrawal in heavy users, which is usually defined as, as daily use. 10%, 25%, 50%, 60%. Does anyone remember that? 
Okay, let's let a few people, um, a few more people answer. Yep, C, 50% of daily users have cannabis withdrawal. What appears to somewhat reduce the danger of THC? Smoking a joint with friends, uh, writing music while high, increasing the dose of CBD and other phytocannabinoids, ex exercising hard after getting high. Anyone? Okay, good, I'll let a few more people answer. Good, that's right. So it, it does appear um, that you, the more of these other types of phytocannabinoids, those things that, you know, hit, that are not an exact key that fit that receptor, uh, somehow it make, make the danger of THC a little bit, a little bit less. Um, have studies proven that marijuana makes you more creative? Yes, all the great jazz artists smoked marijuana. B, no, it makes you dopey. <laughs> Okay, so I put a little commentary in there. Uh, of course, the answer is it does not make you more creative um, and enough studies have, have been done to that, for that. Um, so if you're really super creative, then you're probably gonna still be creative when, when you're high, uh, but it's not making you more creative. In fact, I mean, quite frankly, there are people that are just so brilliant that you could probably get rid of half their brain and they would be much more, uh, much smarter than everyone else. Uh, a somewhat sad story was I, I worked with a doctor who, um, who well, everything turned out fine, but he had a stroke. And for several months, he, you know, he wasn't able to come to work um, because he was a little, wasn't making the connections between diagnoses and medications. Um, and that turned around be, partly because he was so brilliant. He is so brilliant that he can, he could lose half of his function and he would still be smarter than all the doctors in the department. I mean, he was, he was, he's a genius. So the point is, if, you're, if you are Thelonious Monk and uh, you are a genius and you're high, you're still a genius uh, compared to everyone else. But if you're an average Joe and you think that you get high and all of a sudden you're gonna write um, a, a great piece of music, then I can tell you that is not going to happen. And all of us, of course, certainly people my age have been at parties where I just, you know, people are not smart when they're, when they're high. It's just conversations are just not, not connected and smart as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, uh, number 13, does, does feeling like it is not dangerous increase its use? Of course, the answer is yes. Um, and I guess the answer is not, um, the answer is yes, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, you have to do a study to see to see if the two are two are related. And the final question: How much do you like these tests at the end of the episode? They make me want to smoke a joint. B. They are great. I love seeing how smart I am. And C. Brings drug-like flashbacks of nightmare multiple choice tests in school. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. That's great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for your attention tonight. Um, somewhat controversial topic. I obviously am not completely um, impartial. I obviously have a little bit of a bias, I guess, but I feel like I'm basing it on, on science and personal experience with, with friends and such. But I hope you learned uh, a thing or two about, about this topic that seems to be, you know, being talked about more and certainly becoming a very cultural uh, thing for people to be a part of. And um, I hope you enjoyed it. Look forward to uh, seeing you next week. We'll be talking about um, hydration, fluids in the body, explaining how lymph fluid works, how to hydrate your body properly. It's not just water that you need. Uh, lots of different things in that regard, how important sweat is, what they're wired, they're multiple um, benefits to, to sweat and a whole host of other things that we'll discuss as well. So thank you everyone for your attention. I wish everyone well, stay healthy, get your rest, and I'll see you next week.